Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. Before we go out to the wide, if you're watching on YouTube and subscribe to our video show, boy, he's back. He's back. Hamidi Jassim is back. The terrorist whisper is back, which means it's not good news. It's <laughs> I am sorry ahead of time. <laughs> the bearer of awful news, but our best source. You are I feel like you're America's best source overseas and no one is using you but us. Uh, welcome back to the show. Kids, if you haven't seen his movie on Amazon, The Terrorist Whisper, he wrote and directed it himself. Um, it's one of the finest films out there on in the land right now, and uh, the response has been great. Ever since you've come on this show, I mean, shit, everybody's going to Amazon to watch your movie. Um, is it for, is it on Prime or is it for rent right now? It's actually for rent. For rent right yeah. now. Okay, cool. You cool. can rent. Because I rented it back in the day. I didn't know. Yeah. A lot of people go to Prime. Uh, to you can buy it or rent it, and believe it or not, we actually had more buys than rents. Great. Yeah, yeah people that's our audience, it, yeah. man. People want to support, which is awesome. Yeah, and, and they actually want to keep it, go back and learn, because it's the basic of counterterrorism and what's happening in the Middle East, specifically Iraq. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and I feel if, if that's the basic of it, this is the advanced version of yeah. what's going on yeah. with Iraq and Iran today. Um, look, we'll, we'll start with, uh, with why you're here. Uh, you got some info last night um, from some people on the ground over there that uh, to me is pretty incredible. And I don't think a lot of Americans know what's going on. Uh, or look, it's just under wraps at the government, Dan, and you would know more about that than me. Um, you know, I don't think the American people should know everything all the time. Uh, but when we have somebody like you on the show, eh, yeah. might as well let him in on it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, so what, what, what do you got for us today? It's here? a lot been going on in Iraq, perhaps. You know, the, the U.S. media here sometimes is not um, taking you down to the details mm -hmm. of what's happening because, you know, they have sources on the ground. They only get the basics what everyone gets. But there is an ocean end of the iceberg of what really goes on and how things – and, you know, things extremely changed – since the killing of Soleimani. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just Soleimani, Soleimani and Abu Mehdi Mohandas, who was the other key tool for Iran in Iraq. And things just change. Iran behavior, the attitude of that country has changed. Mm -hmm. And now Iraq, it's like basically a, a country with a magic stick and there's not one, there's not nobody to hold that magic stick yet. So there's a competition right now that's been going on about who is going to hold the magic stick because... I used to have that competition in college, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of ladies vying for that uh, magic uh, stick. Unless you don't have assassins, we'll be looking for you. If you, know, if <laughs> you don't does. win, you just walk away. Dan does, <laughs> and that's the scary thing. I have assassins? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Some, of those, some of those bruisers you've dated yeah. could have killed you Ooh. very easily. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And we don't we don't know. Um, we don't know how many yeah. are out there still from, from Dan's past. Oh, God. But... It's the same thing with what's going on here. We don't know yeah. how many are, are out there now trying to kill us over uh, there. Absolutely. I think it, it – and right now, um, it's a – you know, killing of Soleimani might upset a lot of our enemies, you know, like it might upset them. But now some of them are actually getting a chance to be where he was. And the competition right now just started. Mm -hmm. However, um, Iraq, you know, it's been going through – protests, revolution, people are standing up to Iran. So Iran, there's just there's a meeting that just happened in Iran, in Qom Iran. Uh, that meeting was of Iraqi leaders to basically decide and uh, draw a plan of the next era in Iraq. So who was in that meeting? Muqtada al-Sadr. It was actually in Muqtada al-Sadr house. In Iran. In his house. In his house in Iran. Because Muqtada has a house in Iran, mm -hmm. and Muqtada is there right now uh, because he's studying for something, which I'll talk about later to sure. what he's studying and why he's studying for that. Um, and that meeting uh, had a prime minister, former prime minister of Iraq, uh, Nouri al-Maliki, who happened to be a, a rival with Muqtada al-Sadr, and they're trying to bring him together so they can kind of all together with a plan to what the next era of Iraq, because they had a problem putting the protest down and to just, you know, just kind of just destroy the protest and let people go home. And they haven't found a solution yet. 
So basically, they just hired a new prime minister. His name is Mohammed Tawfiq Alawi. Uh, the people who are protesting in, in downtown Baghdad did basically a vote for all the millions of Iraqis who are protesting right now, did a vote in the board because they rejected the guy because he's part of the, the proxy. He's part of the Iranian influence. And people didn't know that, of <laughs> course, or the media. Right. His wife is one of Muqtada's cousins. Really? Yeah. His wife is one of Muqtada's family members. So he's married to a family member of Muqtada's. And Muqtada clearly wants to become the next Qasem Soleimani. But he wants to get the trust of the Iranian government to do so. He is a trying to convince the Iranians that I will be your guy in the Middle East for the next era. And you have a problem is putting the protest away. I'm the only guy that can do that because I have Al Mahdi army, which is the guys we fought back in the surge, me and Dan. Mm -hmm. And I just reactivated them as a, from a civilian organization to a military and a militia organization again. Because, you know, these guys, when we fought them, were a militia. And then Muqtada froze them, made them as a civilian Nonprofit, whatever organization. The Promise Day Brigade or yep, whatever the Promise fuck. Promise Day, all yeah. these names. And now he just switched them back to being a military force to use against the protest. Which, by the way, this is the uh, this organization inside of Iraq that's run by Muqtada al-Sadr and others is essentially a proxy of the Quds Force. I mean, Soleimani, yep. the, what he led, the Quds Force, uh, has been training, arming, and fi financing these guys for as long as I can remember since he exactly. ran the Iraq War, basically. Exactly. Um, so it's been going on for a long time. This is nothing new. They're just, this is some real like S.A. brown shirt style behavior from, from them. Uh, if you remember pre-World War II, the brown shirts were just a bunch of thugs that cruised around fucking people up and acting like assholes and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden Hitler presented himself as the fucking uh, the solution to all these problems. You know what I mean? It's kind of the same t type of situation where Muqtad al-Sadr sees a power vacuum he sees that iran needs somebody in iraq they can they can use mm -hmm. and exactly. he's like well why not me like there's no the thing about Soleimani is you weren't going to find another half iranian half iraqi person like that that has roots in both places like him and his the other guy that got killed uh, like abu mahdi yeah, yeah you're not yeah. you're not going to find another group of dudes like that and the other similarity is that of course of the major Shia leaders, Muqtada al-Sadr, as, as radical as he is and anti-Sunni as he's been, is the only one of them other than Soleimani who's reached yeah. across the aisle to the Sunnis and tried to work with them. Like, yeah. Soleimani's the guy that brokered, for lack of a better phrase, the peace deal between uh, the Quds Force and, and uh, Bashar al-Assad's Ba'ath Party, which is Sunni, in, in Syria. So it's like, this stuff goes back a long time. And these guys ha are very similar in the way they're going about doing stuff. It's not surprising, I mean, <clears throat> we've been trying to kill this guy for a long time. Then he gets into Parliament, and we're like, fuck, we can't just murk him out now. Mm -hmm. And But now he's escalating on the militant side again, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a fucking bomb drop on his head at some point. Uh, by the way, I want to commend you on your reference to the brown shirts. Uh, that was brought up this week. They're asking for um, Chuck Todd to be fired for that. That's what he called Bernie supporters this week. And um, it's... Uh, it's a weird reference to put against a guy who is actually Jewish. Uh, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, Chuck Todd uh, is on the chopping block. Chuck Todd's a turd anyway. He was uh, trending for that yesterday, uh, fired Chuck Todd. But that's dumb to fire him. It's just like he, he's trying to say that they're fucking, the Bernie bros are thuggish and rigid in their beliefs, I'm sure, is the point he was trying to make. Not that they're Nazis. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. I, I highly doubt that a professional journalist is referring to a Jewish guy's fans as Nazis. Well, one would think um, things are the rhetoric is heated up and it's it's look, uh, things have been heating up here in Iraq and Iran. Yeah. Um, what else has been happening over there? Because so, you've got pages of information yep. in a language that I definitely cannot read. <laughs> it's <laughs> fine. I think that's uh, Spanish, if it, I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, that meeting is really important. What's happening right now in Iran and Muqtada's house. Muqtada right now is in Iran studying. Studying to be the next Ayatollah of the Shia in Iraq. And this is a big deal. A lot of Americans don't understand this. Mm. The supreme leader of the Shiite in Iraq is al-Sistani, which has been forever 
that this guy he's like is and he's yeah, over a hundred. He's ninety years old, right? Over way, way over ninety. Yeah. And um, this guy has been the wise man that led all the Shia. They gave him all the fatwas, all the uh, laws they need to know about. It. This is the Pope of Shia in Iraq, and this is a very big, powerful, influence, influence, influential position. Yeah. Muqtada is not anywhere near that level. But he's studying Iran right now, preparing <laughs> himself because since the killing of Soleimani, it opened. It's a it's a, it's a position that's open right now, mm-hmm. and Muqtada basically is convincing the Iranians that the Iranians government that I could be your guy, I will take over Iraq, and I will make sure all your interests. I will appoint somebody that will serve your interest in the area, and that's what Muqtada did. He appointed someone who's actually a family member of his to become a, a temporary uh, prime minister of Iraq, and he's supposed to be have, he's supposed to have only 30 days mm-hmm. to put a government together. But the head of it, the Iraq, as I said, I was talking about the, the downtown Baghdad protest. They did a, a voting board to who would want this guy in, and that guy, through all these millions, only got one vote. One. Wow. One. <laughs> So the one guy went and voted for him, and people voted for him. So the Iraqi people don't want this guy because they know he's part of a proxy. How, why does Iran – Iran is kind of right now in a tough position because they don't have, as, as Daniel said, they don't have anybody that's qualified to take this magic stick, to take power. But they're convinced that Muqtada probably would be the perfect option because he's given them a lot of assurance, a lot of, a lot of uh, promises that he – well, assure him because you have to understand this information that I got yesterday from my source. Um, it's a scary that nobody has this information yet. Yeah. I am I am hundred percent positive. Every analyst right now in any intelligence agency might have twenty five percent of this, but don't have what goes on in the ground or what's happening as it's as we're speaking. Things are changing in Iraq. Why is that? Because um, there's an urgency. They're losing their grip in Iraq, and this is their only hope is to get the grip back because Iran benefits from Iraq. Mm-hmm. There was so much money laundering. There, all the sanctions that we put in Iran right now is not affecting them as much because they're using Iraq as the backyard. And we talked before about Iran using Iraq as money laundering, sure. but now we got the details exactly how they run these operations, which is – fascinating to me it is yeah because there's some people that we might think they're 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 our allies they're stabbing us in the back there are some there's some people who are looking for their interests and don't care about their relationships with us yeah so it is dangerous uh, you know when i when i heard that myself look i was an intelligence source i have heard things before that would amaze me that would be like wow i didn't even know that thing but myself hearing that i was shocked myself to hear it was like wow how are they doing this? Um, well, everything you're saying yeah. makes sense because yeah. whenever we impose sanctions on a country, yeah. it's a splashy headline in the press. Yeah. We don't actually know how it affects these countries. All we exactly. hear is, well, we imposed <laughs> sanctions and they did this. No, exactly. we, do, we do know exactly how it affects those countries. What happens is the, the government starts using the black market to get the shit they need, and they, any humanitarian stuff that comes in, they seize it. And give it to the troops. We we've done to, this to the to the U.S. troops. No, 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 no. Okay. To their own military forces, so they oh, can gotcha. maintain control, and they starve the populace. Like mm. in, in North Korea, if you think that they're hungry soldiers and well-fed civilians, you're fucking crazy. And this is this happens. Every, sanctions are the biggest fucking waste of time. Yeah, of see, it, it's funny because as a civilian, we don't we don't know this. Like we we don't know yeah, anything about but, this. But it but it this way, we put sanctions on Iran. It's supposed to prevent them. And affect their economy, yeah. But it's not doing anything to them, no, because they are using other ways of making money. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're just. So they're it's just, really not affected. They're just uh, fucking laundering money through. Yeah. I mean, when when we first launched strikes against uh, uh, against Iraq back in the day, Saddam Hussein put a billion dollars in trucks and drove it to Syria. Not him yeah. personally, but he had his guys drive a billion dollars to Syria so he'd have money when he got out. A billion U.S. dollars, mm-hmm. not Iraqi dinar. Uh, so that's this This is the fucking go-to play for all those countries that, to, like, he was Bath Party and 
Bashar al-Assad's Ba'ath Party, right? Same, yeah. same Sunni organization. And they, uh, there's some evidence that some chemical weapons were smuggled across the border and blah, 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 and all that shit. Not enough to warrant a full-scale invasion of a country, but whatever. Um, we know that this is what happens. It's, it's the same thing and why I'm so against the idea of closed border policy. Not that I want to be weak on immigration, but because I've seen the effects of it firsthand. And I've done hundreds of hours of research on this to write papers and shit. It's, it doesn't work. The first thing that happens with a closed border is that all the ineffective immigration policies get exposed and people start taking advantage of it. That's the first thing. The second thing that happens is anybody that's down there in the criminal world, mm-hmm. it's all, it, it just emboldens them. You create a criminal smuggling class because people who are really good at getting shit across the border, like drugs and stuff like that, will start becoming very good at it and making a lot of money doing it. And when some fucking uh, Iranian dude pops in and says, hey, I want to get across the border, they're not going to blink. They're going to take his 50K and fucking get him across the border. Right. That's it. So effectively, you weaken your entire defense, your strategy gets weakened by burying your head in the sand and thinking that a wall above ground is going to stop shit. That's fucking dumb. Sorry, guys that like that fucking Trump border wall, but you're, you're wrong. It, it's not going to work. Um, and it's the same with this. Imposing sanctions on a country that's essentially lawless and it's propped up by a major neighboring country is fucking pointless. Like that Iran nuclear deal we had in place. What? You think Iran gives a fuck about signatures on paper, bitch? Get yeah, that, fucked. That never made sense to me. No, it's retarded, man. And, and, and Democrats are bitching that we should never have gotten out of the deal. Uh, it was one of the questions at the debate the other night, yeah. um, which, you know, most of them on stage said, I, w- I wish we would have never gotten out of the right. Iran nuclear deal. Um, I wish Soleimani wasn't killed. All of them said that. Well, here's the deal. Ameri- including Biden, which was yeah, shocking. Yeah. Well, America, for all its faults, and we've got a shady history when it comes to owning human beings, for example, or interning Japanese people in camps during World War II. We've done some fucked up shit over the years. Um, presently, we're ignoring a fuckload of homeless people, mm-hmm. mostly in major liberal cities, but whatever. Yeah. Um, so we've got some, some stains in our past, but we don't, we're not on record saying that a country that exists right now shouldn't exist and we're going to bomb the fuck out of it at the first opportunity which is a, the way Iran feels about Israel. And they've made no mistake about that. They've said it very clearly for the last 50 or 60 years. So, if Simply they, over religion, right? Uh, more or less, yeah. It's more about uh, the Palestinians and, Air, and Arab culture in general controlling Jerusalem. But yeah. uh, at any rate, um, <clears throat> the whole thing is fucking dumb. Putting signatures on paper, signing treaties with a country that's stated goal is to wipe another country off the map. That's that's the dumbest shit I've ever heard of. And I'll tell you what. If Iran wants nuclear power or a nuclear bomb, we can drop one on them. Yeah. Otherwise, that's my negotiating line. Uh, if you want nukes in your country, then we'll drop a few on your capital city, and that's all you're going to get. Yeah, you can scoop there's, it up. There's the no, there's no fucking nego And you... Yeah. Like, you know this because you have contacts in Iran. Still, you know how these people think. Yeah. There's no negotiating with some of these fuckers, man. I'll, I'll, just, I'll tell you something. Right now, let's look at something here. What is the amount of money and the business exchange? What is the biggest country that Iran right now does business with? Uh, Russia. Or, yeah, Russia or Iraq, probably. Iraq. Is it $25 uh, billion dollars a year? That's exactly how much Iran has been uh, oh yeah they're out of selling Iraq. shit to Iraq yeah, yeah and how did you arrive, how did you get that figure exactly uh, so I get this from my sources mm-hmm. uh, that are working basically in the Iraqi government that are working in certain positions in the Iraqi government they can see that exchange but there are details to that exchange is what you don't get yeah because it's okay for Iran and Iraq to do business together but it's not okay for Iran to take the whole entire budget of Iraq because that's how they're using Iraq as a a feeding pipe to kind of make the sanctions less pressure on them, mm-hmm. make be less pressure. So her, here's what's happening. What's happening is, is a twenty five of uh, uh, twenty five um, a billion dollar a year they exchange, and all that there is nothing in return. So basically, what this is is that anytime Iran needs cash, 
uses Iraq for it. And because the people in Iraq who are representing the Iraqi government are basically Iranian agents. They're Revolutionary Guard officers who used to fight in Iran with Iran, and now they're politicians of the Iraqi government, just like Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, who happened to be half Iranians, half Iraqi. Mm -hmm. But he was working for the Iranian interests. And the deals are all fake. All the deals that have been done by Iraq and Iran, other than electricity, it's fake. Perhaps they steal our oil and they buy it half a price. It gets sold in Iran half a price. So they're just sucking everything out of Iraq. And believe it or not, one deal, which that's the information I got yesterday, mm -hmm. one deal between Iraq and Iran, which is funny as hell, it's two billion dollars of snack bar a chocolate bar so they're they're they're, <laughs> they're saying it was two billion dollars worth mm -hmm. of chocolate two billion dollars were exchanged with iran between iraq and iran over a chocolate bar it's a snack bar <laughs> do you think iraq needed who has been in fight with isis who has been through wars back in since the last 16 years do you think iraq really is in need of chocolate bars it's and of, I did the Iraqi? They are. Ask yourself one more question: yeah. Did the Iraqis really get those chocolate bars? No, no. So basically, what is that two billion dollar? What is it that, that two so, billion dollars? So they're they're hiding money through essentially the exchange of fake goods that uh, exactly. don't exist. Exactly. So what they're doing too, also, they're making sure that the Iraqi farmers, Iraq is not producing anything. Iraq is not selling one item to anybody. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They're making sure that Iraq is not making anything. Perhaps these individuals in the Iraqi government who is doing this dirty work for Iran owns factories in Iran. Mm -hmm. So yogurts, goods, mm -hmm. food, anything, fruits, vegetables, the Iraqi farmers are producing these things. Perhaps they're not selling it to anybody. And what Iran is doing is selling its products in Iraq mm -hmm. and also taking your profit yeah. back into them. And uh, this, this information is, is insane. Like, even myself looking at it is, is insanity. And basically, um, since 16 years, since 2003, mm -hmm. the total, the missing money of the Iraqi budget is about $320 billion. So they're just taking that from Iraq. Where, where, you know where this $320 billion went? It went to the projects that never got done. Projects just... So many projects. And this information came, actually, this specific piece of information, mm -hmm. it came from the person who was in charge of making these projects get done, and he's a member of the Sadr Party. He's a part of the Mehdi Army. So, so does he get, you know, a portion of, of that course. money? Yeah. That's why Muqtada is fighting. Look, regardless of the power Muqtada already have, but Muqtada is right now hungry to go to the next level. He wants to be the pro everything. Muqtada has... Every single person under Muqtada al-Sadr had made money. You have to understand, all the other militias other than <laughs> Muqtada al-Sadr army, where did they come from? Where they used to be back in the day? Yeah. They used to be part of the Mahdi army. They used to work under Muqtada, right. and then they branched out. They went on their own because the business is big. Perhaps the one guy we were talking about, Abu Dhar, the butcher. They, they, they put him on American Sniper film as the butcher. Um, Abu Dhar had been running away in Iran, and Abu Dhar brother owns all the garages in Baghdad, all the garages. So if you want your car not to be stolen, you want your car to be in safe place, nobody mess with Abu Dhar. So where you go, you both pay and put your car <clears throat> in one of the garages. Now and no this, one will dare to touch it. If this sounds like organized crime, that's all it is. It is all yeah. it is. Like uh, this, it this is an old school mob. Yeah, it's not, this isn't classical terrorism as we see it. It's organized crime. Organized yeah. crime. But the problem is, that organized crime funds terrorism in the same way that uh, that narco terrorism has been funding Hezbollah all these years and and you know narco terrorism in general with Pablo and all his bullshit and then Noriega and all his bullshit. Um, it's all it's all like any kind of ill gotten gains, for lack of a better phrase, come into play when there's terrorism involved. It just makes things easier. For example, borders. When there are people who professionally smuggle shit across the border. There's, you're going to be able to find one asshole who doesn't care about the U.S. He, he, like, there's a lot of... The mafia, for all their bad parts, actually helped the government catch a number of terrorists over the years. Shit. 
Lucky Luciano helped with some planning against uh, Italy back in the day, against Mussolini. But uh, more recently during the GUI, the mafia, because of their control of ports and stuff like that, I don't. they would never come out and say this because even the guys who are out now writing books and shit – wouldn't say it because it's it's a bad look for them but they've yeah. they've assisted in doing shit like that but there you will find some uh uh people of ill repute that don't give a fuck about this country they just care about money and they will fucking help people get over the border great point right. you brought here about the borders yeah it actually in this information it stated that iran wants to keep the borders between iraq and iran kind of loose and that's the only reason they want to do that so they can actually money launder they can transfer money from the Iraqi banks to Iran. And this is something our government probably does not know. Our government might know that this is how they're doing it. They're doing mm-hmm. money laundering. But there's details into how are they doing it. And that's the question that everybody is asking. How are they switching money? Yeah. What they're doing is, is they're buying the dollars. They're buying the money from the Iraqi banks. Um, and they use certain people who works for them. And they basically take things around. But regardless, they have open banks in Iraq. It's called Islamic banks. And I have the name, actually. It's by the name. These are the three banks. And look, if, if our government is listening, whoever it is, three banks right now Iran uses in Iraq to actually transfer money back to Iran what when the they need those cash. Banks? So the first bank is called Al Elaf, the Islamic uh, Al Elaf Bank. Another Islamic bank, it says Al-Bilad, Islamic bank. The third one is Atanmiya, Islamic bank in Iraq. Three banks that open, basically, and all these three banks do is figure out how to buy, how to change, how to buy the, how to change currencies for mm-hmm. the Iranian, how to actually basically take money in Iraq in a way where nobody can notice these transactions, nobody can notice, and somehow put them in trucks, put the cash in trucks, and drive it to Iran. And there is the dangerous detail that I'm going to bring up. How are they getting this cash out? Yeah, because one, one would think someone would get brave or bold enough to, yeah. to take a truck, right, or to yep. rob a truck. Yep. Who's helping <laughs> these trucks get across the border? Beautiful questions. Fear. So what they did is they established a security company. A security company is basically a better, better core. Better core is one of the Iranian proxy militias in Iraq and run by Ammar al-Hakim. What these guys did is they basically put their assassination teams and formed them as a security company called Al-Aqsa Security Company. How do you spell that? Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa is basically after Palestine. Al-Aqsa. A-L-Q. A- I'm sorry. A L A Q. USA. Um, so Al Aqsa Security Company got the right permissions, armored trucks, badges, weapon permits from the Iraqi Ministry of Interior. Because who was the Ministry of, in, of Interior? One of the Battle Corps militia members. Mm. So have you, you know, when you own the government, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So they formed them as a legal force. They're moving around the country pulling protection. Personal security detail, whatever. So they're allowed to go out there. So when they want to go and assassinate somebody that's not in their interest, they don't have any problem. They can move easily. And they can go pick up anybody anytime, and it's legal. Sure. So what these guys do, they transfer money from Baghdad, from the Iraqi center banks. When they need to transfer cash, they transfer it to Iran. And the way they do it, which is really crazy, like something, and I'm going to say this for the first time. Look, I know some of these guys are allies, but I'm sorry. I'm going to put the truth out there. The truth is need to be said. They take this money, and they hit from Baghdad to Kirkuk. A lot of veterans who are listening know what that is. That's, that's one of the air base that we had in there when we were in Iraq. Okay. From Kirkuk, basically they drive this in armor trucks. This militia or they call themselves Al-Aqsa Security Company, who was basically Battle Corps. Battle Corps <laughs> has a very good relationship with the Kurds. Very good. Amar al-Hakim, the leader of the Battle Corps, and Barzani is very close friends. So you're saying the uh, Kurds have something to do with this? Uh, which I'm really sad to say. They do. And Did Trump know this before pulling out or, or saying we're, we're not going to back the Kurds anymore? 
Uh, I honestly, I find he's got to know. I mean, too, I find it hard Tom. to believe. Look, you might have a U.S. ambassador in Iraq, mm-hmm. but what is this ambassador gonna know? To small little details that are happening outside of the compound, there is no way you can know these things. And you might have intelligence sources, you might have spies that are working or asserting a place, mm-hmm. but this is something that's happening only few people know about. And if any of your sources are not involved in that circle, there's no way you can find out what's happening. And what they're doing is they're taking it to Kirkuk, from Kirkuk towards the northern side of Iraq. So it's not towards the Iranian borders from Iran, to, to because Iraq has a borders they share with Iran, but they're not doing it this way. They're going to Kirkuk to northern of Iraq, and then from there they go way deeper north to Soleimania. From Soleimania, this gets sent to Iran. So in the daily, which I've heard, that sometimes they transfer the least amount. They will transfer in these tracks is about $3 million. In cash? In cash. Shit. Cash. This is not seen because what they do is this could be a fake contract. Exchange Mm -hmm. for... The chocolate bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the whatever. Whatever they are. Corn, vegetables, whatever it is. And they just basically take a lot of money because our financial system in Iraq is still being washed by America. It's still being organized. But how can we cheat the system to make sure America doesn't notice what we're doing? Yeah. Is to use fake Iraqis yeah. who are actually Iranians. And their job is to make all these fake contracts, make all these fake things, and to transfer the money. But the sad part is, ask yourself, when they leave Kirkuk and they enter Soleimania, this is a Kurds area. This is a Kurdish area. I know Kurds are going to hate me after this. But this is a Kurdish area. Does the Kurds have idea this is happening? I find it impossible to believe that they don't. Because... How are they entering Kurdistan with a lot of money, not being searched, not being checked, mm. and enter comfortably if the Kurds doesn't know? So they know. And the Kurds and Badakor and Iran have a good relationship. So perhaps the Kurds and the Iran been trying to keep it neutralized, been trying to keep it in peace. So it looked like here what they're doing is, let me do what I do. I'll not mess with you. And don't mess with me. And right. this is making a difference on the sanctions that we put on Iran. Yeah, which are non-existent, according, which is, according to you, right? Basically, it's, it's, it's not doing anything. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the fact, I have got also information that they take products that were made in Iraq, they take it to Iran, package it, b- b- put it back to Iraq. So they can say, we sold you something, now give us the cash. Sure. So that's the sad part, is that they're taking Iraq completely, its financial system, everything to money launder and to make sure the sanctions doesn't do crap to them. But there is one more, even bigger, dangerous information I'm going to release right now. Okay. And this is not going to be released in any podcast, in any TV station. No intelligent analyst would even think of that. They might have a little bit of information. China. There is a deal right now wants to be happening between Iraq and China. Who wants? Really? Who wants? Uh, big, big time. Iraq right now is going towards trying to make a big deal with China. This has been happening since the protests. This is one of the games they play to saying we're going to calm the protest. Look, we're going to go make a big deal with China. And we're going to exchange. We're going to make this country a better place. There's a reason why China is coming to the table. Because China wants to deal with Iran. But Iran has sanctioned it. And China is trying not to piss the United States. Okay? Mm-hmm. China is right now trying to make that deal with Iraq. Because if they make that deal with Iraq... It means they're going to work with Iran. Because if you're in Iraq, you're going to work yeah, with yeah, Iran. Of course, of course. So Iraq <laughs> is the, the land where China and Iran want to work together. China does not want to make anything officially with Iran uh-huh. because they're sanctions and they don't want to piss the United States. But if they go make a deal with Iraq, and who runs the show in Iraq? And then it just goes, it funnels And right it goes Iran, in there. Yeah. And now, basically, there was a reason that Iraq chose China out of all the planet. They chose China to try to do the deal. And that's where what's happening right now, that Iran is trying to still outsource, still out to sell their oil. They're trying to sell their oil. They're trying to sell their things. Mm -hmm. But the only place they're using is Iraq. And look, $320 billion missing out of Iraq? Where did it go? Yeah. It went right to Iran. And and this this is not just stealing Iraq. This is not just 
since the sections, the sections were recent. Iran has been making money and getting a lot of strength through Iraq. And that's why they never going to mm. let go of Iraq. By the way, that amount of money uh, missing would be the equivalent of the U.S. government had misplaced about $25 trillion. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Because Iraq's means. GDP is about $200 billion. So let me ask you this, Dan, because, you know, you were over there. Mm-hmm. Are, we have troops currently over there. Why aren't they checking any of these trucks? They're not there to do that. They're not involved. They're, they're there essentially to be QRF, train local forces, and be QRF in case Iran tries to attack or something like that. But if you, got, if you got information like this, would this cause you know, Here's, a, a phone call to you know, some commander saying, hey, man, yes. now you can start checking. There's, like, a, there's a division with, inside the agency called TFAD. It's ter- Terrorism, Financial, and Arms Division, basically. So they track uh, digital money networks, the Hawala network, which is – a hand-to-hand currency exchange that is ancient in Arab culture. Um, they monitor all that stuff, money moving around. They absolutely have some inkling that this shit like this is going on. Just because they'll see $320 billion show up in Iran and that amount of money not, and leave Iraq. But mm-hmm. they're like, wait, Iraq doesn't even have that much money. What the fuck? And right. I want to clarify, $320 billion, that's over the 16 years. Yeah, yeah. Over the 16 years. Over okay. the 16 yeah, yeah. years. Gotcha. So they, that, they, they, see, they see that amount of money, and they're like, what the fuck? Like, where is this coming from? How Iraq doesn't – like, Iraq is spending – we can tell that they're spending all their money on, on uh, resources for the civilian population. And shit. They're not – like he said, they're not generating any kind of resource that they can sell to other people. But somehow money still – coming in and going out it's weird as shit so tfad would know about that and they would certainly report it up the chain but is that actionable i mean look in the intelligence community sometimes it's good to know something and continue watching than it is to know something and try to do something about it like if this deal with uh china is really going through Mm -hmm. what tfad and others would be doing right now particularly involved involving the state department they would be trying to find something super embarrassing about the deal or about the parties involved to keep China from making that deal. And then they will release it through a back channel to China. Like, hey, we heard you're trying to fucking do this. Here's what we know about it. By the way, do you remember this very embarrassing story? Right, right. I'd hate for that to get out. Yeah. That's kind of how you play those games. So it's, it can be easier to do that than to just uh, – that is more effective than an actual um, – Sanction in the UN, in my opinion, is working the back channels. That's what people like uh, Charlie Wilson were so good at back in the day as, a, as an elected representative. Like to a to a to a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? But we've got a lot of weapons in our tool bag. We don't just have to fucking smash people all the time. There's a lot of smarter ways to deal with stuff. Like all the shit I talk about Reagan and his bad tax policy over the years rollback which is where we started an arms race with russia broke the back of their economy and that's why we won that's one of the big reasons we won the cold war right right it was there's three periods there's containment detente and rollback and rollback is probably the one that did the most damage yeah financially they just couldn't keep up right Right. so that's what you do in war you you don't just it's not like sports in sports if I've got a great fastball, I'm going to my fastball, even if the guy's a great fastball hitter, right? Because that's my shot. If I'm Steph Curry, I'm going to pull it from 28 feet and shoot because that's my best shot. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in war, it's different because shit happens in war. Somebody shows up two minutes late and the whole fucking operation's fucked or bad yeah. weather. There's so many things that can go wrong. So you play to a combination of your strengths and your enemy's weaknesses. If you know one of their weaknesses is they can't get money into the country the way they need to, and they're looking to do a deal with a big country like Iran or uh, China or fucking Russia, then yeah. you fucking get in between it, fuck it up, do something to politically embarrass everybody, and then be like, oops, my bad, guys. Yeah. And that is more effective and less costly in human life than, than actually fighting. And I want to clarify something. Um, hopefully I don't get arrested after this show. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they go from Baghdad to Kirkuk. That's exactly what this Al-Aqsa uh, security company, basically the Battle Corps. From Baghdad to Kirkuk, um, which I want to answer this question, from Kirkuk to Soleimania, and okay. probably, so probably somebody going to say, how are they going to get it from Soleimania to Iran? From Soleimania goes to Benjamin, Iran. 
and that's what they do. So it is actually they make about one, two, two stops in Iraq, and the third one is in Iran. And the $3 million goes in straight to the Iranians. Um, this is beyond, and I think that's why Iran right now is trying to ensure that Muqtada could give him all mm. these insurance before he takes over Iraq. Yeah. And if Muqtada becomes where al-Sistani is, if Muqtada becomes the pope, basically, Yeah, the forget about leader, being prime minister, which is what he was oh, trying to do earlier I this mean, year. This is a way more powerful position. This is power because anything you say, if you say jump, they'll jump. Yeah. You are basically the religious supreme leader. Whatever you say, people are going to do. Yep. It means you can take the whole country to war. You can stop. You, you basically, you will have the control mm. buttons of everything that you want to happen. And Muqtada, like psychologically, educational-wise, he's not there. But he's studying, basically, and Iran is trying to fake something. Because the supreme leaders of the Shia in Iraq is in Najaf, not in Iran. But who is teaching Muqtada right now? Where is Muqtada studying to get that position? Mm. In Iran. Yeah, Najaf is a holy site for Shia in Iraq, or for Shia globally, I suppose, but it's a big deal there. And, and that's where the religious leaders are. Yeah, yeah, that's where the seat of power is for sure. That's exactly. where, when we, when we were there during the surge, Derek and myself, Jared, and uh, Omar Via Crispy was there. Uh, Bert Koontz was there, mm -hmm. same general time frame. Uh, he was, uh, Muqtada al-Sadr was hiding in Najaf at the time because he knew nobody would fuck with him down there or the people would help hide him or whatever the case was. Even in his own city, Sadr City, he wouldn't hang out there because he knew we were going to come in and fuck that shit up, which we did. And it was fun, but it didn't really accomplish a whole lot. Uh, <laughs> I like you talk about it as if it was spring break. You know, it was fun. We didn't get a lot done, but, you know, it's you a good know, time. Life is a lot simpler than... I'm a lot more comfortable uh, yeah. dealing with combat than I am real life. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it was always like that or if it became like that because of high-intensity operations and stress and shit like that. But uh, even right now, if I could go to war and then come back every, like, once a month or so just to hang out, I would do that. <laughs> you know, just because it's, it's fun. It's, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you about that. Yeah. Honestly, I don't know if any of this makes any sense. Um, at any rate, it's like an orgasm for a year. Yeah. It is a fun experience. Yeah. You don't, <clears throat> you know, there might be negative to it, but it's a, it's a feelings that you get when you're overseas mm. that I think for every American that served over there that you don't get it anymore. And once you enter that environment, it's hard for you to leave it behind. Imagine that if you have a, some kind of a joy or a different, imagine if you live in a video game. Yeah, yeah. And how fun it is, and all of a sudden I take you out of it, and you're not there anymore. It has to, that's what affects, that's what PTSD is about, guys. It's not about, um, it's not about that you only saw harsh conditions and things that were tough. It's also about the things that you're not doing anymore. Um, and I wanted to actually be, um, uh, back at this, which is something, a, a very important piece to the audience that they might not understand. Why Muqtada wants to be in that place. You have to know this has been the dream of Muqtada since day one. Since the first day in 2003 we liberated Iraq, this has been the path that Muqtada has been bathing. How, how old is he, by the way? Uh, he's in his late uh, 40s right now. Okay. But there was a guy who was more qualified <laughs> than Muqtada in 2003. His name is Abdul Majid al Khui, who is the son of one of the biggest supreme leaders, which basically equivalent of a pope. In Islam, for the Shia Islam. That guy was out of the country because of Saddam. In 2003, that guy entered the country. 20 hours after entering the country, he got killed by Muqtada al <laughs> And who actually executed that operation for Muqtada was Qais al-Khazali. Really? Qais al-Khazali is now uh, the guy we just passed his information as one of the most wanted people in the terror list for Iraq. Trump just passed that yeah, yeah, against yeah. Kais al-Khazali. Kais al-Khazali was the one actually that executed that operation. And where that guy was, that guy was in Najaf. When he arrived in Iraq, he went to Najaf. He went to visit the religious site, and he was a praying inside. They came in, pulled him out, and literally like swept the floor with him and killed him. You just execute him right there? Right there, and just killed him. And Muqtada... At day one, got rid, of, got rid of anybody that would be a threat to him. And who does this remind you of? Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Yeah. 
So if you know that this is the way to get to power is to get rid of your rivals or competitors. Bro, that guy was not a rival to Muqtada. He didn't have anything. Uh, it was a competition for power. And if Muqtada killed somebody in 2003, that might be a threat to what's Muqtada's dreams today. It means Muqtada is right now getting ready to make his final footprints on becoming the most powerful religious figure for the Shia in the world. So is that, is that your prediction? It's not a prediction. It's what's happening. But no, but do you think it is going to happen? Unless he gets uh, killed. Yes. Yeah, unless, yeah. I don't think we're going to answer try Muqtada. A lot of people have asked me that. Perhaps even I was talking to my source last night. He's like, do you think they will strike him? I, I kind of thought about it for a minute, and I said, no, I don't think so. Because uh, he's a smart enough knowing not to do anything stupid against Americans. Look, since, since Trump have made a message saying, if you do anything against our embassy again, I'm going to take military actions. And since he appointed the new Iraqi prime minister, has anybody attacked the embassy? Has a bullet went towards the embassy? No, no because he is trying to have self-control. He's trying to watch over his interests. Yeah. And he's trying to give Iran the assurance that, look, regardless of what happened, I'm going to assure all your business, all your money laundering, all of what's happening is going to get done the way you want. You know all these protests that have been going on? They're soderists. He started all this shit. Like, it's, it's him, Right. But not not the recent one. Not the revolution. recent ones yeah. against Iran are not him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like the 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 protests that have been going on, the anti government protests that have been going on over the past couple of years. Yeah. that's mostly been him. And now, what was it? Seven, six or seven days ago, his guys went into actually in the Joff. There was a sit in protest going on, and they fucking beat the fuck out of everybody and told him to leave. So yeah. he's he's like trying to project to Iran and and maybe even the global community that he's in charge. He's the only one that has the powerful to, to put the protest away, mm -hmm. to get them to go home. But, but people are not going home. They're very politically mm -hmm. educated. They're, they're like saying, no, we don't want this guy because you appointed him and he's a family member of yours. But what he's doing right now is he asked his, his Mehdi army members to put a blue hats on their head to go there and uh, – try to convince people to go home and do it nicely. It didn't work out. So now he just actually, in the last 24 hours, ordered his men to take off their hat and, do, and not come home. Stay there. Just take off your blue hat so that you, don't, you can't be recognized anymore. And what's been happening in the last eight hours right now, uh, people in the protest who's just among the protests are getting stabbed with knives. Crazy. Yeah. Um, I want to. We got some sponsors. Look, every time you come to the show, uh, it's always so fascinating. I, I almost forget about the sponsors, but I got some more questions for you afterwards yeah. about uh, who's next on that list and why. One of our sponsors, mybookie.com, um, promo code Drinking Bros doubles your deposit, actually posts uh, Dan, <laughs> who, will, who will be the next terrorist yeah. killed over there, which is fucking hilarious. Those guys are way ahead of the game. They're not going to be, bookie. it's not going to be any of these. Uh, I, you know, and we'll get to that because I'm, I'm curious as to why they put up who they put up and, and maybe we can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Look, beauty of them. It's president's month. Uh, they are it's president's day, month, year, whoever, whatever they're the you want to call it. They're 25 percent off everything in the store. Beds, sheets, pillows, mattresses. You name it. Ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros is giving it to you for 25 percent off. I know you're thinking the, the, the 36 month page you go program, no interest. Does that still apply? Yes. Yes, it does. So you can go there, max it out with everything in the store that you want, and then uh, get a page you go program and knocks it down somewhere in the $20 ish range. Um, and again, that is including adjustable bases. So you could be all propped up in your bed with your lady, um, plug in your I iPad into the bed because they've got USB ports in it. And uh, watch the show. Uh, watch Drinking Bros podcast on your uh, good old iPad with your lady in bed. Or you can, you can pop it up on the TV. Your call. Probably uh, want to go sp I'm, spread eagle for that. Spread eagle jacks yeah. on something like that. Um, I just, I'm looking for excuses to use the USB ports. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Uh, I got to plug the bed in. Bed in it. I, uh, plug the, the iPhone into the bed, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, D'Anthony, who, who we got? What day is this? Yeah, it was Sunday night, brother. Today's Sunday night? Yeah. Um, ExpressVPN. 
expressvpn.com forward slash drinking bros. Protect your digital butthole, people. They're out there. They're out there in the world trying to get your passwords, trying to get in your bank accounts. Trying to get into your butt. Yes. They need a, you need a seamless app that runs in the background of all of your devices, iPhones, uh, iPads, fucking desktops, soft tops, hard tops, laptops, all of it. Um, that, that will protect it. Anybody trying to get in or out. You get a bunch of weird emails every day about weird shit that people mm-hmm. may or may not be trying to purchase from my credit cards. This protects me from everything. I Look, I've had them for, I think, about 14 months now. I haven't had one issue, knock on wood, um, with expressvpn.com forward slash drinking bros. With them, it is $7 a month. If you sign up for a year, you get three months for free. It's worth it, people. It's 70 bucks, man, to protect yourself. Plus, if you work at a job that's got a firewall on it, uh, you can watch porn. You can watch March Madness coming up. You can beat everything at your workspace, which we wink, wink, highly recommend. Go to expressvpn.com forward slash drinking bros today. Uh, best in the business as far as cybersecurity goes and, uh, and also trying to escape the fucking horrors of work. Uh, and a lot of March Madness games coming up, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of pools. We're going to have one in Drinking Bros Sports on Facebook. Uh, last but not least, Anthony. What? Who that is? Uh, Raycon, actually. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> Buyraycon.com forward slash Drinking Bros. Uh, here they are. Boom. Um, raise the prices a little bit. I was incorrect on the new ones. Mm. No wonder. I mean, they're cheap as shit. Uh, yeah. The new ones last for like six hours. Mm. So they're like maybe 10 bucks more. Uh, knocks it down to $68. Um, on the new ones, but look, man, if if you're having wireless headphones that plug in and they last for fucking six hours, Jesus yeah. Christ, man, uh, I get it. I, I get the little bump up in, in pay, uh, but they're doing big things over there. These are the these are the headphones that you see everybody wearing in the airports, and you're like, dude, who? What brand is this? It is Raycon. Mm-hmm. Go to buyraycon.com forward slash Drinking Bros. Best in the business as far as wireless headphones go they last six hours they come with a, a million different sizes for the rubber ear pieces mm-hmm. so that way no matter how big your ear hole is there is a size for you and or your loved ones if you swap them and go to the gym or uh just muck them up because you're yeah a filthy don't human being. don't share don't share it's disgusting don't share go to buy raycon.com forward slash drinking bros today knocks it down it's 15 off knocks it down about uh, 68 bucks total um so we love those guys mm-hmm. uh how many uh, as I was saying on mybookie.com, um, yeah. they have a list of terrorists uh, mm-hmm. that you can bet on for the next terrorist uh, yeah. to be killed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we looked at that list before we went on air, mm-hmm. and you actually said it was someone else. Yeah, um, who, who who is that? Who's the top of the? Um, the only the reason I right said now. it was someone else because you know you have to look into the politics or what serves the the campaign here for the presidency. There's a lot of things that goes on to. Between killing a random terrorist, how effective that was going to be, like some just guy we've been looking for for the last 20 years. What is it that makes for us at this time? So the only reason I chose Case Mm Al-Khazali, which is the leader of uh, Mm Al-Assad, who actually used to be someone who worked under Muqtada. He was one of Muqtada's top Syria killers. And after that, he realized he was good enough to star on his own. And uh, him and Abu Dura worked together now. And... uh, I chose Kaisal Kazali because recently the administration have passed his name as somebody who's wanted on a terror list and also has a frozen a lot of his uh, finances, a lot of his banking, a lot of the things he was, he was doing. And uh, the intention and the lights has been on Kaisal Kazali okay. for a while. And uh, if, if, if any one of you listening bet on that guy and make some money make sure you give me half <laughs> <laughs> find, find the terrorist whisperer on ig hit him up in the dms yeah. you owe him half the money yeah um even if you buy me a sandwich i'll take it man. yeah, yeah just, just don't be cheap of course yeah. are you let me ask you with all the info you have and how yeah. useful you are are you currently working for our government no, I've been on the training site of things, uh, training uh, military troops. Um, because you enjoy that? or uh, Because I feel it's a duty. You know, For me, it's, it's, it was about saving military guys who were operating in Iraq during the war. Uh, for me, that has never been a job. It's always been uh, a duty. You know, My life got saved by Americans first before I got recruited by the U.S. intelligence. It, it's a debt that you just keep returning. One returns to another. Um, 
I am not working for the government right now in anything uh, specific any or capacity, anything like yeah, any yeah. capacity. Uh, I'll say this for the first time that I always see people a lot less qualified that are doing these jobs. Um, and that's, you know, how that's how it is. Uh, it's politics. Uh, there's a lot of people get promised in campaigns. I, I'm a guy that don't have loyalty to any political uh, person. I don't. My loyalty is to this country, and that's it. Sure. I don't pass anywhere near that. If if you're a Republican or Democrat, I'll give you exactly what the truth is. If it serves you, that's great. If it doesn't, uh, serves your agenda, that's your problem. Uh, for me, if I ever do that, I will not change anything. I'll be the same person. That's how I've been for the last uh, 16 years uh, involved in this world. And uh, I, I don't. And I have never been asked to do – other than doing the military training and preparing troops because this is about their lives. Mm -hmm. It's about their safety, and it's important to me as much as it's important to the government. But anything in the political era or advising or anything like that, uh, no, I have not been. And I'm very careful when it comes to things like that. It's surprising, though, because – I feel – look, all of your predictions on this show have come true. Yeah. I think it's your fourth or fifth time on the show. Yeah. Um, it seems like you know more than everyone else out there. Yeah. If I was listening to the show, and a lot of people in D.C. do yeah. listen to the show, yeah. I, I'd pick you off and just say, hey, man, let's – why don't, you, why don't you come play ball here in D.C. Uh, and work for us? That's uh, because that's, there's a difference between you and Fox News. There's a difference. Uh, you know, to some uh, media outlets and some other places, it's about the looks. And you know you're a filmmaker. Yeah, absolutely. You know this. It's about the person that's delivering them. Well, well, they give you a storyline yeah. of yeah. whatever you know. Yeah. Uh, narrative they're trying to push for that day. And then yeah. no matter what your answers yeah. are to questions, they always try to lead it back to that. Correct. And if you don't play ball, you don't yeah. get invited back Look, either. I, I, I know that. I said this to an intelligent agent I served with in Iraq, and and you guys are gonna laugh about this. I said if the terrorist whisper was a really good looking hot chick, I would have been somewhere else. <laughs> so if that explains to you to how things run, gets run, yeah. that that should be answer your question. It, is that it, if the terrorist whisper was a really good looking Middle Eastern chick, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, man, it would have been like Nick yeah. Jonas's wife, <laughs> like, like her. You know, oh. you know who that chick is, right? The, At that the point, chick. I will be somewhere else. So I, I kind of understood the system, and it's sad. Hey, this is the reality. I'm not lying to you. Mm. You know, a lot of my fans have been ta tagging Joe Rogan nonstop to have me on. Lots of my fans. Oh, look, which, if, if I if I, if I was friends with him, I would just reach uh, out to him I, and say, I, "Hey, man," because to me, you're I, one of the most fascinating people on the planet. And we love having you on as much it, as we can. And it really is. You know, it's, it's, a, it's because, look, it's my world. I lived in that world. I worked undercover. I collected intelligence in this enemy. It, it's, my, it's what I know. If you asked me to build a house right now, I wouldn't know how to do it. But, uh, you know, coming back to Joe Rogan thing, I, I don't know. You know, I, I wasn't sure, you know, why certain people, uh, I hate to say that, but there's some individuals uh, did not do as much as I did. Right. But they still give more lights on them. Uh, so I realized, unfortunately, this is the one thing that I, I don't like about, I wouldn't say America, but yeah. about the, the platform is that it's about people, how they look. And, and, you know, when people think about like, hey, uh, who was really saving American life? Who was really killing terrorists? It was just brown looking Iraqi guy. Yeah, that's yeah, what it was. Yeah, yeah. And that's the truth. But if, if someone wants to make it in a film, they're not going to make. Look, have you ever see, watched a film in Hollywood that had a guy that looked like me that was, that was saving Americans? No, no. They, they would get Benicio del Toro. To play exactly. You. So it, it really is just that I am not. I am against the wave, and the wave doesn't serve me. And that's the truth. And uh, uh, I could know about a thousand times more than the guy that's right now offering advice uh, for the Republican Party. Let's say, um, but it's still that guy looks a lot better than I do. Well, I, I'll say yeah. this. In the case of Rogan, yeah. we, none of us have been on. Um, yeah. And the, the biggest shocker was Matt. Yeah. Matt, the, look, I'm, you can see the book right here. Yeah. Matt does fit the, the look and the part and all that shit, mm -hmm. even yeah. promoting yeah. his book. Yeah. And it was fucking number one in the world, and he didn't go on. So, yeah. It's, it's strange. It, as I said, you know, for me, um, look, putting my story out there for me personally, mm -hmm. uh, it's a duty. It's not about profit. It's not about really just selling a book or having you watch the film. There is a purpose to what I do. Uh, when I see young Muslim Americans are taking the good route because they got motivated by my story. When I see a young guy sends me a message and say, 
man, I was a kid in high school. I was watching your book. And it gave me a reason that I couldn't be part of the U.S. military. And I'm, an, I'm now a U.S. Ranger. I'm a Ranger in the U.S. Army. That is my goal to put my story out there. Because there are a lot of books out there, right? Yeah. There's a lot of stories. There's a lot of like SEAL stories. A lot of motivating stuff to that audience. A lot of SEAL books, by the way. A lot. Uh, <laughs> There's a whole lot. Trust me, it's a whole another world. But the thing is, is that I am speaking to, I am resonating with an audience that's a very dangerous situation where, um, you know, Al Qaeda, ISIS, everybody's trying to tap into these individuals here that are, are, are Americans. So I am still in the fight, but not physically. I am not psychologically in the fight. And, and my job is I'm going to continue to do what I do, whether the media, Hollywood, whether. Uh, the government pays attention or do, you know, I will do anything for the government if it serves the nation because my debt is owned to the nation yeah. of this country, well, the fight to the people. The fight's not all about, it's not all on the ground. Like we're, wars can only do so much. Yeah. Germany and World War One is a good example. If you win the war, but you fail the peace, then war again is inevitable, right? Yeah. And that's what, where people like this come into play more than anybody um, is, the only, the only cure for hate and ignorance is information. Exactly, education too. Yeah. So it's like you can't, uh, we can't all fucking be gunfighters our whole lives or spies or whatever the fuck. At some point, you have to tell you, like I, I think the idea of PNGing somebody like Persona non grata for like Delta, for example, for CAG or whatever the fuck you want to call them now. They change their name every twelve minutes. Or uh, Dev Group, SEAL Team 6, whatever they're going by these days. Um, I get the 15-year suspension before stuff becomes declassified and talk about it. I'm fine with that, but these guys need to tell their stories. I'm not one of those people that are anti that because that's that information coming out, realizing what went down for real mm -hmm. and what the stakes were is so important to people to be able to learn from that and also to – it's a good lesson for people going into the military now because they hear these stories from disaffected guys a lot that are like, it discourages you from joining the military because I don't want to be part of this organization. It's, it's going to war is never easy, but it's easier when there's a clear cut objective, but that's not the world we live in anymore. We're playing chess, not checkers, right? You don't get to jump two pieces and then come home and celebrate VG, VJ Day. Yeah. That's not how it fucking works anymore. Now it's like we're in a fucking thousand-year battle, and you can't win a thousand-year battle on the battleground. It's won in people's minds, ultimately. And that's where I feel like this information needs to get out there. People that have true perspective and inside information on what stuff's really like. For me, if I had read stuff like that when I was younger... <clears throat> I would have been even more voted, motivated to join the military, but I would have been a little bit more reasonable about my approach to it. You know what I mean? It would have been different because people suspend their sense of agency and often their sense of morality to do war. Like it's not a normal thing to take another human being's life and it, and it affects people differently. Um, and you suspend your agency insofar as you give up, you subjugate yourself to the whims and the will of the U.S. leadership, the government, the military, the whole thing. Yeah. And that is not an easy thing for people to do. And then when you come out on the other side of it <clears throat> and you realize that you were severely misinformed about what this all was, then that is how you become disaffected and depressed. You know what I mean? If... It's just better to walk into something with your eyes wide open. You know what I mean? Right. Like, this is complicated. We're going to do some stuff we're not comfortable with sometimes, but we believe that modern Western civilization is better than 8th century Arab civilization, which is what they're still living in now. Uh, we believe it's better. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's more inclusive. The economy works better. There's better access to health care. There's all this other stuff that comes with modernity where... It's obvious that this should be the choice, right? But it's not always like that because you have third world dictatorships and countries that, you know, for competitive advantage economically want to destabilize us and blah, 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 because we're the big kid on the block or whatever the case is. Whatever it is, it's all complicated. And if you try to make something complicated seem simple, people are going to start asking questions. Then they're going to get fucking pissed. 
and that's what yeah. you've seen since Vietnam, basically. And I'll tell honest, on it, I want to answer something. This is something I'm not supposed to say, and I've never said it before in any media, any podcast, any interviews of my life. And as, uh, it's a bomb I didn't ever want to drop. Uh, and to answer your question, mm-hmm. uh, why I said this about the platform. Uh, my book has been out for five years right now, since 2015. And, and this story, th- th- you know, nothing upset me. I have seen a lot of death. I have seen a lot of disappointments in my life. I have seen a lot of things, man. But this upsets me more than anything. And it actually kind of motivated me with my story. And I, I never, never said that before, but I'm going to say it here. And, and I appreciate you guys because you guys were something out of the platform. Mm-hmm. You guys were normal people. And you guys had me here, and you guys believed in, in everything I do, yeah. and you trusted me on it, and I appreciate you for it. So for that, I want to release this here at Drinking Pros okay. and nowhere else. Um, in 2015, a lot of writers have approached me, you know, the ghost writers who will write your story. Sure. And one of the ghost writers who approached me was a really big name that wrote a book that became a blackbuster. And uh, it was really upsetting. Uh, when they saw my script of my story... And I wouldn't mention publisher's name or anything. Um, an email that I kept to this day, and, and I'll show it to you. And I got an email back from one of these big writers. And, of course, these guys are not people like Daniel that ever been to combat. These guys never been out of Cape Cod, for God's sake. Yeah, yeah. They sent me an email, and that's when I really got to know the platform here, how things work in this country. And the email stated, your story is really amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, you saved a lot of American lives. It will look great as a movie, but we're not really sure how would the American public receive this from a local, uh, from from a foreign national. I I, I say it foreign national. Yeah. I, I don't want you. When I read that, I truly never cried in my life other than leaving the MOD and pulling out from my enemies in 2008. And that made me cry because when I heard that email, God, it, it ripped me off inside. Like when I heard that word foreign national, I was an American at that point. Right. And I was like, I, I read it and that's what the platform, that's what the agenda, that's what they were looking into is saying, well, th- what, what the translation of that sentence was is that Hamity, you did a great things, but regardless, you're not white. Yeah. <laughs> you don't look like a hero. Yeah. And sorry. And when I got that back, the second writer came back and, you know, asked it, okay, well, I'm going to add some other information. I didn't want to, mm-hmm. but I kept that email to this day, you know, and I, I did it on my own. I went out. I, I, I got my book out. I didn't, ca- I didn't believe in it. I didn't believe, but it f- insulted me. I didn't believe in it. Absolutely, that person was wrong. And I actually today can sit and say to that person, you're wrong. The American people weren't that way. And they don't think like you do. It's you and your platform that think this way. But did did not, you write him back and tell him that? Never, but I, I will one day. Yeah. I want to I do even bigger things than this. Sure. And then I want to I wanna really, uh, I wouldn't write him. I'll probably talk to him from the public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. That, that, uh, sorry, I, go ahead. I think I know who you're talking about, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... He writes, it's, a, he writes a lot of... Uh, no, he's a big name. I mean, yeah. he's, a, he's a really big Ghost name. Ghost writing-wise, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he's really, really big name. Uh, you know what? He, he spoke honestly because this is what his platform is. This is what the platform out there. This is exactly what you see. Yeah. And when they told me, you know, it just for me, it's like, you know what? All these American lives that I saved, did I ever freaking care what they look like? Do I care what they, do I ever knew where they were from? Did I ever knew what color skin, what religion they brought? Right. No, that, that, that wasn't our reality in Iraq. Mm, no. And I see some bastards who have never, you know, been outside of his driveway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Tells me this. It just makes, it, it made me lose it, man. It made me look into that and saying, wow, like, did I ever think there are people think this way? But that actually motivated me. If it wasn't for that email, if it wasn't for that person, I would not have put my story out there. If it wasn't for that person, I would not have been as successful as I am now with putting my be- book, directing him. And that's the reason why I directed my film, <laughs> which you probably wonder why as a filmmaker. Why did you go do that on your own? It's tough, yeah. Cause you, because when, I yeah. didn't want the platform to tell me what to do. Sure. I went did it in my own. I didn't want a producer to come over and tell me this is what I know. I did it in my own. 
And that's how it resonates with the American people the way it did. That's why it's now people mm. learning a lot from it. No bullshit. Just learning. Yeah. And seeing the truth for what it is. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, that's, that's the first time I talk about this. And I have this email. Um, and you know what? Uh, years later, I found out that, th that this, this writer uh -huh. actually wrote false stories. Stories that 100% have been vetted to know that these military operations were absolutely false. And it didn't happen the way it did, the way he wrote it. So I, it kind of made me kind of laugh because yeah. I'm like, you, you, were, you basically were, you cared about the person looks more than you cared about their accomplishment. And if that's the case, I will never want to want you to be involved with you. At this point, yeah, and I I can say this, you know, from because uh, I know a lot of these ghostwriters for books, right? Yeah. I did it a lot for screenplays, uh, movies, but mine were yeah. comedies, right? Yeah, um, it didn't really matter if I'm writing a fictional scene for whatever. I, I've never ghostwritten anything for uh, a biography or somebody's yeah. real life um, because I, I want to be held account accountable if I got it wrong, right? Yeah, exactly. Same when I was working with Matt, I was like, hey man, I, I would love to help you tell your story and write it and and, yeah. and all that stuff, but. If there is something that is inaccurate, yeah. the advantage of having me on the cover is, hey, man, I worked with this guy and he fucked it up, right? Yeah. Uh, you can always have me to fall back on because I, you know, yeah, I'm in exactly. charge of it at the yeah. end of the day, whatever. Um, yeah. And I've, I, I've never ghostwritten anything for, for books. Yeah. The guys that do it, though, are actively seeking out people with a great story, yeah. a sexy cover, yeah. trying to sell the, the, the biggest, splashiest thing. Yeah. And then here's, what ha here's the other part of that that you probably don't know about they'll go back to the publishers and sometimes the notes from the publishers will be like hey man can you kill a few more people in this chapter yeah can you add Sad. to these wars explosions you know anything to make them bigger sexier more fun um okay. and dan look you've got a lot of friends that have written hey. books and or had there, books written for them. There are a lot of people that never killed a, ki a chicken in their life. Yeah. Uh, bigger than I am today, But you'd man. read their book <laughs> and you wouldn't know otherwise where you're like, ah, oh, shit. I, I know. That's the thing is when you're, in my, when you're in my shoes, yeah, you know the truth. You know what happened. You know everyone's position and influence back during that time mm -hmm. and era. And era, era. you just, you just, you just kind of bite your fingers. You're just going like, damn. Some yeah, of them do, have been do on people Rogan. believe in that? Some of them have it's been dumb. on Rogan. <laughs> I, like, I understand the idea of... Uh, making stuff a little more Hollywood to make it fit into a screenplay or whatever the fuck. But uh, these people don't understand that they're, you're taking someone's story that means more to them than anything could ever mean to them. Yep. Um, like it's life or death. Their friends died. They killed people. They experienced the worst things you can experience in life. And you, it's a, sure. like, oh, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to change a few minor details because it plays better on camera like now. Fuck you. Yeah. Honestly, like that Zero Dark Thirty movie. First of all, no one says Zero Dark Thirty. They say Oh Dark Thirty. So I don't know where the yeah. fuck they even came up with that stupid bullshit. That movie was the biggest pile of garbage that I've ever seen. Nothing in it was accurate. Like that, the idea that a CIA analyst, even a, a successful one like that, would look at Is that the, the one fucking, you watched on the plane the other day? No, no, no. Okay. The idea that that person would look at this is the one with Chris Pratt and J Edgerton and, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, all yeah. those. Uh, yeah. uh, Jessica Chastain was the lead. Um, the idea that a, that an analyst would be questioned by the director of Central Intelligence and say, "I'm the motherfucker that found him," she would get fired right there and never work again in the intelligence community. Like, oh, we got to play this fucking tough girl shit. The raid part itself was okay, I guess. I mean, there's there are people that we know that were there that we could call and quantify that. I mean, we've actually done, I don't remember what episode it is, but Rob O'Neill's been on the show to discuss his involvement and all that stuff. Um, but for those guys that were there on the ground, it's got to be tough. Like, there is, a, there is actually someone in, uh, we have a big group for everybody that was at our combat outpost on Facebook. Um, I don't know how many people were the hundreds of people in there. And there's this one fucking admin kid turd, probably. I don't know. Maybe he was good at doing admin stuff, but he wasn't a fucking shooter. That's going to tell the story of cop Callahan. I'm like, Oh man, dude, <laughs> like honestly, that is, uh, you're fucking with people's lives right now doing that. Yeah. And I just straight up told the guy, I'm like, look, if you come out with some fucking bullshit, I will fucking use every fucking piece 
Resource. of influence I have to shut this shit down or to embarrass you publicly because you can't fuck with people's lives like this. Yeah. You're not fucking... It'd be one thing if it was some Hollywood dick. I mean, I just roll my eyes at that, but somebody that was actually there that's going to tell some fucking retard story from the perspective of a fucking cook or something. Mm -hmm. Like, look, we need cooks, but don't tell stories about gunfights, man. That was my gunfight. Right, that wasn't right. yours. That's like, can you imagine... And I, I hate to associate the two, but these are fucking momentous tragic often traumatic situations can you imagine if some woman got raped and somebody wrote a first-hand account of it from their perspective and fucked all the details up imagine how that would feel uh, it's it's crazy man and and look people have asked me numerous times since matt's book of like hey man we is this what you want to do do you want to keep writing you know <laughs> military books like this no it isn't it was yeah. one of my best friends and he, he, he asked, and that's, that's it. Like, yeah. Otherwise, like, I, I don't know people well enough on yeah. a day-to-day -day basis to, to even attempt something like that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to try to get to know someone. Oh, hey, man, we, we, here's, you know, we're going to spend the next two months together, 60 days, writing a book. Like, I, I don't have that interest because I, I would yeah. fuck it up. Like, you and, know. you know, as a filmmaker, you know yourself, like, I, the reason why I, did my, I made my story into a documentary because I want to separate myself from everyone else. Yeah, and you want to control your edit. You uh, want to uh, make sure everything you're putting and, uh, out is real. And I wanted to separate too. Yeah. Because you know when you see a lot of people getting accused, their inflated stories, and it, it really makes me feel embarrassed. You know, I, I'm like, uh, of course, if if there's so many of people doing that, people are not gonna believe anything you did, and yeah. and it's insulting to you because this is an emotional thing for me. You know, like th I lost people for a piece of information. I have friends of mine; their life ended right in there for a piece of information and it, it's it means a lot to me it's not just someone that goes and make things up and there's no damage to anybody for me this this was damage mm -hmm. an emotional damage so i did it and that's why i got everybody that was involved in these operations to come and give this to the public so that people can see and it separates my story from other people and uh and, and I'm glad, you know, I'm glad that whatever that writer thought that day, how the American people think, I'm glad I proved them wrong. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm glad that I, I still had faith on the American people that they don't think this way. They don't care what my skin color is. No, uh, and it's, and it's just some dick looking for a fucking paycheck. I it, think, it really you know, is. Yeah. I, I'm a Starship Troopers guy. Yeah. Yeah. You're a big yeah. Starship Troopers guy. I think uh, Gasper Van Dien is you one should, of your heroes. Like, you should have to earn your citizenship some way or another. Not everybody can serve in the military, but there's civil service. There's all kinds of shit you can do. You can help little yeah. old ladies across the street. Yeah. yeah. But uh, if this is the greatest country in the world, like all the greatest things that exist, right? Like the best teams in the military, Dev Group, Delta, Special Forces, Ranger, all this stuff. You have to get in. There's a test to get in. The NBA, fucking all sports. Yeah. Being a fucking CEO of a company, there's a test to get in there. And the idea that we're born with inalienable rights is meaningful to me. Like, everyone has the right to try to be free and happy. Um, but all the rest, like, if you want to be part of the best, then you have to give your best. So all these shiftless layabouts that are fucking collecting government checks, nah, you're done. You're done, guy. Uh, <laughs> you're all, right. all, all these fucking turds that are milking the system, all these people that want to bitch and complain but not contribute, yeah. get fucked. No. Get fucked with all that bullshit. I, and Starship Troopers, the reason I made that reference is to become a citizen of the, of the country, you had to serve mm -hmm. somehow. Compulsory service. Two years in the Peace yeah. Corps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And fucking go work at the post office. I yeah. don't give a shit what it is. Like, do something that helps your country. And if not, then that's fine. You can live here. I mean, every one of us, you know, that's the beauty about Americans. You know, everyone brought something to the table. That's how I looked at Americans from an Iraqi standpoint. Everyone, every American brings something the other is not bringing. And that's what makes it the melting pot, you know. And, and then, as you asked me before, is one day I will answer that person, that ghostwriter, in the proper way. When my story becomes a motion picture, mm -hmm. because I want young Muslims to have someone to look up to. Someone who is not Ilhan Umar, not Rashida Talib. I don't want them looking at that version. Right. And this is not just about trying to make myself look like a good guy. No, I don't care about that. What I care about is I want that young generation of Muslims in America to have something good to look into. Mm. I want a mirror for them that's going to show them America, not something else. And, you know, 
I'm putting myself on a mission. I put myself on a mission five years ago to change that. And I've been getting some results. I've been getting guys to become rangers. I've been guys to get SF. I've been guys going to the Marine Corps, adding something to the table, as Dan said. Sure. Uh, making these young Muslims to come and ask them to the table yeah. and be part of the process mm. of all of us. Because I'm like, look, if I can be part of this, so are you. So can you, yeah. And nobody's opposing you here. Nobody is really, what they're telling you is not true. They're telling you, oh, there are people here making your success fall. Look, I know. I dealing with the platform, the plat, some of the platforms, like I'm talking about media and everything. Yeah. They want things in a certain way because they're evil, because they're evil. And they're insulting. They're degrading. And that's that message. What it was, it was degrading to me. Yeah. And uh, I think you would be insulted uh, if you were, did something for a oh, rack. Yeah. And, I've, I, look, and I've, it, I've heard the worst shit in the world. And, and, I, and I, I, by the way, it's funny you, you mentioned the yeah. thing about the email. Yeah. I'm sitting on one as well that I'm holding back on for. Yeah, uh, a couple more years where I'm like, uh, yeah, and I'll unleash that one and say fuck you yeah. to that individual <laughs> yeah. person. Uh, but I'll wait till it gets a little bigger, same as you. I, I hope one day I can get this dream to happen. And uh, <laughs> you know, Hollywood has never done that. Hollywood always have got people like look like me to play the bad people. Yeah, and I, I and they say they're not racist and they're anti GOP and they don't like the GOP for certain things. But hey, uh, if you don't like it, it's called rads. Yeah, make yeah. it happen. Russians, Arabs. Yeah. What's the other one? And then uh, smokers. Asians. No, it's Russian, uh, Arab, uh, something D, D and then smokers. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Rads. That's yeah. what they like throughout the fucking eighties. And it. Yeah. And it really for me. Look, uh, if Hollywood means this, uh, if they really mean caring about these minorities. <laughs> Do something positive for them. Do something that they can make them feel comfortable, be be proud of, or something they can belong to, or they can attach themselves to. Mm-hmm. And that's what I see today with a lot of young Muslims. They can attach themselves to me. They follow me. They talk yeah. to me every day. Hey, I want I want to be like you. I want to go in the military. I want to serve this country. Imagine a guy like Joaquin Phoenix, yeah, getting on stage and complaining about all this stuff, including the treatment of minorities in Hollywood, but making yeah. a movie that only had white people in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exact. That's then, exactly. What then I'm winning about. his was, Oscar for it. There was a black it. kind of girlfriend, yeah. but that was about it. And yeah. you know, R- Rami. Well, Mo- she wasn't real though. <laughs> uh, no. That was all in his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as a filmmaker, Ross, that they have to be an actor that can fit the character. Yes. And for me, right now. There was only one actor in Hollywood that can fit this character. It's Rami Malik, the guys that did uh, Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that guy fit the He's character. He's uh, Mr. Robot as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That He's a little it. small for you, like short wise. He's but a little he, skinny. That's how it is. I was skinny when you saw yeah, the yeah. film. That's, yeah. how, yeah. that's how it is in Hollywood. He's, he's about your height. Don't, don't make him look. Normal. I only got big when I saw eating American food, guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> when I was on, on the Iraqi diet, it was bad. <laughs> you come over and get American food, boom, you're, you're back at it. You get some Arby's <laughs> yeah. in your belly, dude. <laughs> no, Five, uh, it's, it's not Arby's, man. I'm a, I'm a big junkie in barbecue. You know, you'll find mm. me in every barbecue joint in the country. <laughs> no one knows of. Perhaps I tell Texans about where to get the best Texas barbecue. It's pretty fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now's the point in the show. We get to the drinking bro of the week. This one was submitted by Christopher Scott Davis. He says, hey, guys, I'd like to nominate my old high school friend, Chad Rowe, for being uh, the guy that tattooed Post Malone's face under his eyes and for just yesterday uh, tattooing Posty's calf and a dozen of Post Malone's crew. He's a badass t- tattoo artist and is making a name for himself in the industry, and he deserves the honor of being Drinking Bro of the Week. I'm assuming he's in Salt Lake or somewhere in thereabouts. He would have to be. Um, first of all, cheers. Second of all, uh, we, love, we love Drinking Bros like this because you can, you can nominate anybody across the board. Uh, and then lastly, we are still trying. We're working on Post Malone. I'm heading out uh, in three weeks to Austin, Texas to uh, see if we can pull off the elusive post malone interview and i will ask him about chad Rowe. uh that's some pretty good info post malone just got another face tattoo yesterday so yeah, i heard um, it's uh it's crazy not a lot of real estate left on that face for any more face tattoos and he's pretty he's too good looking in real life posty stop getting face tattoos we love you uh we also love you hamidi one of our favorite guests. Love and, you guys. Uh, and again, I, I really want to repeat this. Um, go watch the Terrorist Whisper on <laughs> Terrorist Whisper on Amazon. Amazon. Um, you can rent it. You can buy it. Um, it is his story. Yeah. He made it. I know you guys love him on the show. Uh, support him by going and, and buying and or renting the movie. And uh, and certainly you can follow him on Instagram. You've, you've got one of the best Instagrams on the planet. Yeah, you can well. follow him on YouTube yeah. now. I think you, you're publishing the yep. Terrorist Examiner, which yep. is like... Uh, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah, 10 uh, minutes literally sometimes. Uh, yeah. It's just like a review of specific people that we're dealing with or specific issues that we're dealing with. 
Yeah. Uh, unbelievably fascinating guests. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell you what, we will put your trailer at the end of the show. So yeah. if you were watching on YouTube uh, under Drinking Bros Podcast, uh, if not, subscribe. And uh, we'll put uh, the Terrorist Whisper trailer on yeah. the back of this episode. It's Anthony and Anthony Holloway, Hamadi Jasim. I'm Ross Patterson. We're the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone. An Iraqi, he gets to places in the ministry that we never could get in. Individuals like the Sergeant Major were very, very valuable to us. Moody gave us information that, if utilized correctly, could change the ultimate outcome of the Iraq War. Even walking by a room, he could hear conversations, and I validated this over my year, where he'd hear the real conversation going on, and he'd give us that information. Individuals in whom we could have enormous trust and confidence, uh, individuals with whom we could communicate effectively. Uh, you know, his English language skills were, were quite good from early on. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, in any case, it's helpful. It's also helpful if he's going to be someone who's on the lookout for potential threats to, to our soldiers. That's where he was effective for us, but that's where he was dangerous to them. Without Hamidi, I'm about 99% certain we would not have survived our tour. He was very descriptive about things. He would give us detailed, uh, in-depth information, and frankly would go out of his way uh, to do things that we never asked him to do, nor would we have probably ever asked him to do in order to get information, the photographs, names, documents, whatever that may be, to pass to us, which it certainly enhanced his credibility with us. Even if it cost him his life, he was gonna risk it all to make a difference. There are blood debts between us. I would not be here today if it weren't for him. That's a fact. I'd be buried somewhere.